It was the biggest song in 1980 by a band that defied all classification. I mean, you just couldn't put these guys in a box. They had connections to new wave, rock, punk, disco, reggae, even R&B. You never knew what you were gonna get with them. Versatile and experimental, they were musical chameleons. So it's no surprise that they jumped at the chance to try something new when the opportunity came knocking. Even though they were actually the second choice, I'll tell you about that coming up. The chance to headline a movie soundtrack with a completely new sound, enter an eccentric Italian producer who worked tirelessly to write the perfect song for this band. But the band's phenomenal front woman, she liked the music, but she rewrote the lyrics on the fly after watching a rough cut of the movie. As you'll find out, the song was better than the film. In the end, though, the song was put on the soundtrack and not on this band's new album, denying them a lot of sales, maybe even millions. Find out why and the story of this song next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you have ever sworn out loud in frustration, complete frustration, whenever reading Rolling Stone's best of list, best singer, best guitarist, or best bands uh, that they put out every so often, you're gonna dig this channel of pure musical nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe below right now, click the bell so you always know what's coming out. Also, check us out on Patreon for even more content. It helps us keep it a daily channel and check out our merch. Oh, Rolling Stone, how far they have fallen. So today we're covering one of the most successful acts of the late 70s and early 80s. Talking about Blondie. Past episodes, we've given you the stories behind some of their biggest hits, uh, Heart of Glass, One Way or Another, also Rapture. This time around, we're dialing up an absolute monster. Their 1980 hit single, Call Me. Call me, call me. Call me. Oh. So in 1982, Blondie producer Mike Chapman made a bold claim about his third project with this band, 1980's Auto American. So this is what Mike Chapman said, I'm quoting him exactly. While we were making Eat to the Beat, I felt Blondie was something like the new Beatles because they came up with these extraordinary ideas, so many hits. By the time we came to make Auto American, I guess it was their Sgt. Pepper because it's a very unusual album. A Sgt. Pepper comparison, that's a strong assertion for anybody to make. I mean, remember when Terrence Trent Darby compared himself to Sgt. Pepper's album, pretty much killed his career overnight. But you know what, bold or not, Mike Chapman's comments underscore an important truth about this incredible band, Blondie. This band was eclectic. They were experimental. They freely crossed so-called genre boundaries. Although Blondie formed uh, as far back as about 1974, their classic lineup wouldn't coalesce until about 1978. The six-piece outfit consisted of vocalist Deborah Harry, guitarist Chris Stein, drummer Clem Burke, bassist Gary Valentine, uh, keyboardist Jimmy Destry, and bassist Nigel Harrison, also guitarist Frank Infante. Uh, Blondie was never gun shy about experimenting with a broad spectrum of styles. Innovation, it was in their DNA. One of the most important and influential bands of the New Wave movement, no question. Their sound, it readily incorporated elements of punk and rock and disco, reggae, hip hop, and rap, just to name a few. Said Chris Stein, we got tired of the narrowness and the limitations imposed by the press, by the people, the record company, and radio. You know, as to what we are allowed to do and what we can't do. So they vowed to be different. This is a band that was always up for trying something, anything new. Sandwiched between 1979's Eat to the Beat and 1980's Auto American, Blondie was about to try something brand spanking new, even for them. They were gonna headline a movie soundtrack and the resulting track would skew harder than anything that they had done previous to that. The project started with a phone call from the great Giorgio Moroder. 
the Italian godfather of disco himself, uh, renowned songwriter, producer, and hit maker, Marauder, tore through the 70s, kicking out albums while also uh, driving the career of disco diva Donna Summer. Turning his attention to electronic music for movies and television, Marauder composed the score for Midnight Express in 1978, uh, for which he won an Oscar. Later, he would add projects like uh, Flashdance and Scarface, as well as Berlin's Take My Breath Away and uh, other songs for Top Gun. With the clock running out on the 70s, Marauder was turning his attention to the American Gigolo soundtrack. That would be released in 1980. For this one, director Paul Schrader of Taxi Driver fame would put up-and-comer Richard Gere on the map with this one. The future officer and a gentleman actor played the role of a Los Angeles escort named Julian Kay. Yep, Julian, who earned a pretty penny for his services, lived a lavish and detached lifestyle with an upper-class clientele. However, things get complicated for this hustler when he is caught up in a murder investigation and he's framed for a crime that he did not commit. Uh, the movie did well to win over critics, but it left many viewers wanting. Richard Gere, Lauren Hutton, American Gigolo. For the soundtrack, that was only comprised of eight songs. Six of those were instrumentals. Marauder had a hand in writing all of them. And although Giorgio Moroder invited Blondie to perform the theme song for this film, they weren't actually the first choice. Uh, after composing a basic synth track for the song, Moroder actually approached Fleetwood Mac Stevie Nicks. Uh, he envisioned her writing the lyrics and singing the vocals. But uh, Stevie Nicks had to decline due to contract obligations. Uh, in particular, she was gearing up uh, for the release of Fleetwood Mac's Tusk at that moment. So in uh, Stevie Nicks absence, Georgia Moroder went ahead and he wrote the lyrics himself and he created a demo. Uh, he actually called the song Man Machine. However, realizing he still needed some help, he reached out to Blondie. Debbie Harry was excited about this offer and she said about the project, we really tried to vary our music and we really tried not to mimic ourselves. You know, once you sort of establish a formula, some people stick with it because it's safe and people know it and like it. We tried to be a little daring, end of quote. Marauder and Schrader, they respected that approach and they agreed to give Debbie Harry total creative control over the lyrics. There's gonna be no restrictions whatsoever. Describing Marauder's demo, Debbie would say that the lyrics suffered in translation. So what exactly was Marauder's version like? Well, apparently it was all about Richard Gere's character being a mechanical lover. Said Harry about it, Giorgio is a real ladies' man with real Italian machismo. He always had the beautiful girlfriends and women all around him. I couldn't sing Giorgio's lyrics because they came from the perspective of a man with a huge sexual power. Clearly, that wasn't going to work for Harry. So to get an idea what she should write, she actually just watched the film. Paul Schrader consented to showing it. So they were all invited up to his room. Uh, this was at the PR Hotel. And they watched a rough cut of American Jiggle right then and there. Uh, an instrumental version of Marauder's track was already in place. This was helpful. But it was the film's visuals, its muted tones and evocative colors that really sparked Debbie's creative imagination on the lyrics. In particular, she was taken by a stunning image of Richard Gere's character driving a stylish car down the California Coast Highway. So after they finished the movie, Debbie was very deliberate. She walked right back to her apartment, you know, with the film's visuals and the music uh, just fresh in her mind. The first lines of Call Me came to her instantly. Color me your color, baby. Color me your car. And from there, it just all flowed. The lyrics came to her just effortlessly. Once at home, she wrote everything down right away. And the lyrics were much better suited for her. Uh, they were more subtle than what Marauder had written. Cover me with kisses, baby. 
cover me with love, roll me in designer sheets, I'll never get enough. As the song's title and chorus, Debbie said it had to be, call me. You know, because that's what Richard Gere's character would say to all the women. When the song was recorded, the band was actually uh, replaced, for the most part, with Marauder studio musicians. Uh, this was outside of Chris Stein's guitar work. Future mega producer Keith Forzy, who would work on a lot of big movie soundtracks over the years, he was on drums and percussion, and Harold Faltermeyer, he was... Uh, of course, did Axel F. He was credited with keyboards and arrangement. Speaking of credits, the soundtrack album only credited Blondie, the band, on vocals. Now, the band was really frustrated that they were essentially cut out of the recording process for this one song, but they took it in stride due to the song's mega success and this opportunity. Another interesting side note here, uh, the bridge of the original English language version of Call Me includes Deborah Harry saying, Call Me in two European languages, Italian and French. Uh, they also did a version in Spanish. Call Me was recorded at the power station. This happened in August of 79. And apparently all they needed was just an afternoon to lay it down. The instrumental track was already done, so it only took Harry a couple of hours to lay down her vocals, including the harmonies. The result, it was absolutely mesmerizing. Call Me with its thumping beat and hard-hitting electric guitar. It was as Stein called it, a heavy song, just a real kick-ass song. That's what he said. As we continue to break down this one, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny I wear the glasses I always wear. You can beat inflation with Zenny. You can get new glasses for everybody in the family without breaking the bank. Design your own pair of glasses to suit your needs or your style. You can choose the shape, the color, type of frame, and you have so much to choose from. There's reading glasses, migraine relief glasses, progressives, transition lenses, and bifocals, just to name a few. Click on the info button right up here to get up to 80% off regular retail prices. So Debbie Harry was pleased that Call Me sounded totally different from other Blondie songs. A result that according to Chris Stein came from George Earl listening to all of Blondie's albums and trying to craft the ultimate Blondie song. Reflecting on the afternoon in the studio, Harry would say that Marauder was very, very nice to work with, very easy. In Blondie's view, it went so well that at one point after the project, they were even thinking about recording an album with Marauder, with him at the helm. However, as it turns out, um, he wasn't feeling the same way. Um, Georgia Marauder would later tell Billboard magazine that working with Blondie was a difficult experience. Uh, and that actually it taught him not to work with rock bands. Said Marauder exactly, there were always fights. I was supposed to do an album with them after that. We went to the studio and the guitarist was fighting with the keyboard player. I called their manager and I quit. Uh, but Debbie didn't take it too hard. In her estimation, Marauder was just really intense. He was a perfectionist, and so he didn't have much patience with people who fool around. Uh, things were never easy with Blondie in the studio, really. We talked about it in past episodes. Uh, even uh, Mike Chapman talked about that. As far as the fighting went, the more popular that Blondie got, the more they seemed to struggle as a band. With superstardom on the rise and all the trappings that came with it, you know, the drugs, the parties, the expectations, the pressure, it just started to become a little too much. Tensions were running high and arguments broke out very often. So it's no surprise that with Marauder, who wanted a drama-free zone, wanted nothing to do with this. But you know what? They had this massive hit to show for the time uh, working together. Honestly, as soon as he heard Deborah singing a rough version of Call Me, he said, I knew right away they had a hit on their hands. It was released on January 29th of 1980, the very beginning of the 80s. Call Me was the first single drop from the American Gigolo soundtrack. Um, again, had a lot of instrumentals. It was an instant hit. It went straight to number one in the US and it became Blondie's second American chart topper uh, after Heart of Glass. Call Me, it would stay on the top for an impressive six weeks. It also went to number two on the U.S. dance charts. The year's end, it was crowned Billboard's biggest single in the United States. 
I mean, it beat out a lot of strong competitors like Pink Floyd's Another Brick in the Wall, uh, Part 2, uh, Olivia Newton-John's Magic, and Michael Jackson's Rock With You, just to show you how it beat all these other uh, genres and songs. Internationally, Call Me was a massive track as well. It was top 10 success around the world, went to number nine in the Netherlands uh, and Belgium, went to number six in New Zealand, number five in Austria, number four in Australia, number three in Finland, Switzerland, and Sweden. I went to number two in South Africa, Norway, and Ireland, and went to number one in Canada and the United Kingdom. Call Me even made Debbie Harry the first woman in UK chart history to write three number one hits. Heart of Glass and Sunday Girl had both preceded this song. In the decades since this release, Call Me has left a huge pop culture footprint as well. It's appeared in such a long list of movies and TV shows. You go to IMDb and you're just overwhelmed. Just to name a few, Family Ties, Quantum Leap, Jag, Zoolander, Mindhunter, Law & Order, Organized Crime, Pitch Perfect 3, For the Love of Money, of course, American Gigolo, the TV series, uh, Pretty Little Liars, The Crown, Westworld, and Better Call Saul, to name a few. Call me. Oh, love. Debbie Harry also sang this one during her 1981 appearance on The Muppet Show. Do you remember that one? I loved it. As far as covers go, Rod Stewart's done it, so did No Doubt. Franz Ferdinand, Wilson Phillips, the Dandy Warhols. Today, though, Call Me has been streamed over 650 million times. It makes it the second most streamed song in Blondie's catalog, just after Heart of Glass, which, well, not just after. Heart of Glass actually has over a billion streams. Okay, so the release of Call Me on the American Gigolo soundtrack brings up a really interesting thought, one that I've touched on, uh, I think, once before on our channel. Uh, if a band has a soundtrack hit, does it make sense for them to add it to their next full-length album? As I mentioned earlier, Call Me was released between 1979's Eat the Beat and 1980's Auto American. Just kind of out there on soundtrack island, if you will. I mean, had it been released on Auto American, it would have given Blondie three number one hits on just one album. You know what? Call Me was only available on the American Gigolo soundtrack album, or you could buy the 45. Uh, in my research, there wasn't a lot of info available. Um, uh, American Gigolo, the soundtrack, it was released on Polydor, and Blondie, of course, was on Chrysalis. Here, as I can tell, Polydor wanted it on the soundtrack only. They wouldn't allow it on the record. Blondie didn't push for it either. The band, believing the success of Call Me, was kind of past once Auto American came out. But this was back in the day when you could only get the song by buying the album, right? It's before digital music. More on that in a second. I think, in my estimation, it would have doubled sales of Auto American. Definitely helped the American Gigolo soundtrack since it had no other songs by a major artist, just instrumentals, like I said, and that soundtrack would sell over 500,000 copies. Sorry, nobody's buying it for the instrumentals. <laughs> I know today in the, the age of digital music and endlessly customizable playlists, it's not really a big deal. Albums have become something of a lost art, unfortunately. But back then, as a listener, you had a tough decision to make in situations like this. Do you buy the American Gigolo soundtrack because you want that one song? Guess you could buy just the, the single, the 45, but uh, there wasn't a lot of options for that for people that grew up in a small town like me. Maybe you just recorded off the radio, which a lot of us did. I mean, really none of those options are ideal if you wanted to listen to Call Me along with the other great Blondie tracks. So what do you do with a soundtrack hit if you're a band? Financially, it makes more sense to put it on your next album. In Blondie's case, Auto American was released the same year as Call Me, so both were pretty close together. 
In the past, I brought up a similar situation that Jackson Brown was in. Also Huey Lewis with Power of Love. That's the power of love. Brown recorded the hit song, Somebody's Baby, for the iconic 80s team flick, Fast Times at Ridgemont High. This song was actually Jackson's biggest hit on the Hot 100 of his career. She's got to be somebody's baby. However, he purposely chose not to include it on his 1983 album, Lawyers in Love. As it was, Lawyers in Love didn't do bad, it sold a million copies, but its strongest single only reached number 13 on the Hot 100. I mean, like I said, I think Somebody's Baby would have dramatically increased sales of that album. And I think Call Me would have done the same for Auto American. What do you guys think? Are the soundtrack hits better left off full-length albums, or should they carry over to the next LP? Uh, if it's not a theme album or a, a concept album, I think they should. But share your thoughts in the, the comments. Let's talk about this. Really, the best thing about American Gigolo, a movie about a male prostitute, is Call Me by Blondie. <laughs> There's no question. Reflecting on Call Me's success, Deborah Harry had this to say. We didn't expect it, but it legitimized us in the country and made people realize that we were adventurous. We had a vision that could transcend the styles of the day. I hear bits and pieces of Call Me and other people's songs even today, not direct copies of it, mind you, but similarities. Music either works or it doesn't work. It was the right place, the right time, the right sound. It all just sort of fell into place. Indeed it did, and the world is better off because of it. Thanks, Blondie. Hey, thanks so much for watching us. Leave us a comment about Blondie and call me. What are your memories of the song, of this movie, of this time with Blondie? There was just, like, nobody was like him. They were just unbelievable. Let's have a great discussion below. If you like our content, uh, we would love to have you subscribe and be part of our channel and our community to celebrate the greatest of the rock era. Till next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.